helicopter that's possible, but they'll have to go through. Beast 1, call you sitting command. Out here. We're starting to get multiple things. Hang on, we're helping out. Class 2 team entering. We're able to move up. We have problems. Hello and welcome. My name's John Getter, and we really appreciate you joining us for this special program today about a very difficult and important topic facing all of America. Wildland urban interface fires. It's a mouthful, but more than that, it could be a major threat to your community if you don't prepare properly, and that's what we're about today. What are wildland urban interface fires? What are they like? What happens when these fires hit communities? Uh, how does it affect the firefighters, the homeowners? We're going to be addressing all of that today, and we're going to start out by asking that simple question, what are they, of Bill Mills from Colorado Springs Fire Department. Bill? Wildland Urban Interface Fire uh, is unique in that um, we're talking about disciplines in agency or community or in, in the value programming of firefighters. Uh, from natural fuels to man-made fuels or vice versa. And the primary carriers in most cases in wildfire would be your natural fuels as carried to the constructed fuels or the structures that the urban firefighters are interested in. Um, so it's a really, it's an interesting collision of, of, of not only physics in that the natural fuels uh, and their relationship with the structure is, is, is a physical property, but it's a behavioral piece also. Uh, behavioral in that um, wildfire types that come through the agency's value program early in their careers in a specific way, in a way of thinking, believing, and behaving. And, and the structure fire types come up through a different world. And so as we work together, uh, now we're we're not only changing some physical properties as it relates to wildfire and structures natural fuels but we're changing some behavioral properties as well and bill it's interesting to know too you use these two phrases together that a lot of people probably over time have not considered together both urban and wildland because they really do affect each other even though they're very different and they are affecting more and more people as i understand it really rule of thumb is that anywhere natural fuel comes adjacent to constructed fuel or structures uh, you might have a notion of wildland urban interface um, many definitions uh, classic urban interface or classic interface might be something that's viewed as having a, a very typical frontier in other words you can turn and point to the forest and see it um, Intermix, maybe something as sim uh, simple as structures and urban density as it relates to forest. Uh, occluded interface might be uh, development that simply surrounds our notion of what forest might be. So rule of thumb is that just about any place that you could come up with natural fuel as it relates to constructed fuel could be considered this notion of interface or intermix. It's a big topic and we have some big help today. Joining us uh, along with, uh, with Bill is Mike Darty, the U.S. Fire Administration. Also Dan Bailey from the uh, U.S. Forest Service. And uh, over here on the uh, far end of the table is uh, Chief Will May from the Alachua County Fire and Rescue. Uh, people who don't know where Alachua County is, it's essentially Gainesville. 
Gainesville and North Florida. Yes. North Thank Florida. You. Thanks all of you for joining us today. We heard what Bill was talking about there, kind of uh, setting the table for what we're going to be discussing here, these fires. But Mike, let me ask you this. You've, you've been somebody who has, you started your career jumping out of airplanes to help <laughs> fight fires out in the woods, out in the forests. Yeah, but more and more of these, these forests in the cities are becoming almost one, aren't they? Yes, they are. I think what's important to realize is that the wildland firefighter now is having to, on a daily basis, deal with, uh, with homes and construction in the wildland setting and the urban firefighter is now having to deal with the wildland and they're coming together and I think it's very important that they learn how to to work together and and meet together and, and plan together for these events because they're going to happen in each other's backyards and, and and working together I think is going to be the key to success. Dan, uh, how do you put that into practice? Well I think that it uh, all over the United States, we're seeing you know more and more wildland urban interface fires occurring. So you know it's forcing uh, this um, interaction between structural fire departments and wildland people to uh, you know to work together. And when I say forcing, it, 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 there's a lot of training and a lot of things happening uh, mm -hmm. you know in advance of these. But it's really kind of uh, bridging the gap of what it's been you know a decade ago with these two. Uh, uh, you know, wildland structural people working together in, uh, in an effective way to deal with these types of fires. And Will, have you found uh, big changes in the last several years because of the development in your area where, where uh, the, the, these two areas are coming together and you're fighting different fires than you may have a few years ago because of the, this confluence of people and the wildlands? Yes, we are. Uh, with the rapidly increasing population of in Florida and most of those that most of that population growth are folks that are not familiar with the Florida situation. They've typically retired from uh, remoter parts of the of the nation. Um, what we're finding is that since about the mid-90s uh, that uh, in Florida the Structural Fire Service and the Wildland Fire Service, uh, which is primarily a, a state level service, have begun to work more and more together. Uh, we're cross-training uh, the, uh, the wildland firefighters are receiving a uh, NFPA Firefighter 1 level of structural fire protection training and uh, the, the structural firefighters are going and getting the training at least to the Firefighter 2 level in wildland standards. We're also picking up the incident command system that has been used for many years by the wildland services and we're integrating that into our process. Dan, I would think a lot of folks watching this might have the initial impression that, that which I wouldn't expect to hear about this in Florida. I always thought these were in the big forest that people like you t help us take care of out in the west, in the mountains and so on. And they certainly are there, but they've been happening all around the country, right? Well, that's right. I think one of the things that people don't understand, and I think the perception is that it's always been a, a, a problem in the west, but you uh, look around over the last two decades and it's uh, wildland urban interface fires are occurring in New Jersey, New York, in Minnesota and Texas, I mean, it's pretty much across the board in every state. They're seeing these types of fires and these kinds of situations occurring. Mike, that's got to make it a, a big challenge, changing quickly, especially in light of 9-11 and the new emphasis on anti-terrorism in the country. I think so. I think that uh, the, uh, the folks working together and needing to work, work together is, is it's kind of a it's, a, it's a different culture and bringing the two cultures together is, is very important. I think that, as Dan was saying, the, uh, the interface problem as it is spread across the country, partially is, it's linked to issues related to the climate. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're a little bit hotter, a little bit warmer. We're finding that the, that the, uh, the fire seasons, as we call them, are, are lasting longer and they're more severe. Uh, the acres burned every year is increasing. It's getting to be, it, it's getting larger and larger. And with more and more communities being built in the, in the intermix, it's creating another dimension of a problem to the firefighter. They have to dealing with public safety and, and evacuations. Mm -hmm. And they can't, and they have to deal with those before they can concentrate on, on extinguishment of the incident itself. Bill Mills, these fires seem very different. Uh, they, they behave in ways that can be very different from simple wildfires and simple building fires, I understand. 
it's very, uh, very opportunistic. Uh, I know that for years and years in the fire service, we could model uh, fire behavior as it relates to, stru to structures inside the cube, inside the shape or the house. Uh, th the environment is fairly static. In other words, the consideration for fire load um, and the contents, uh, it's pretty predictable. Uh, with Mother Nature involved, uh, if the wind's up, all bets are off. Uh, fuel, weather, and topography all play dynamic parts in a wildfire, and, and dynamic meaning that just ever-changing. So notions of modeling as it relates to wildfire behavior are simply snapshots in time. Uh, the industry is moving toward more real-time looks at being able to model wildfire, but it's, it's, it's truly a dynamic event. So they're very different, they're very dynamic, they can be a big challenge for the firefighters, but many of you may not have actually seen one of these wildland urban interface fires other than little snippets in the news. So before we get too much farther into our program today, let's get a little more on these fires and how they behave. Each year, thousands of wildland fire ignitions occur throughout the United States. Each of these fire starts must be managed to meet identified resource management objectives. In order to select the proper fire management option, we must have a thorough knowledge of wildland fire behavior. When an ignition occurs, it has the potential to grow into a major wildland fire, depending on the existing environmental conditions. It may have dramatic effects on resource values, appearance, and public opinion. What unleashes this powerful force of change? Well, it begins simply enough, perhaps a carelessly thrown match, an unattended campfire, or a thunderstorm. Then before long, a rapidly growing wildland fire, which requires extensive management. Yet every wildland fire that starts like this doesn't become a big fire because firefighters like you may intervene and stop it. Firefighters who know how a wildland fire behaves. In order to manage fire, you must learn the characteristics of fire and the factors that influence fire spread. The more you know about wildland fire behavior, the more likely you are to select the appropriate fire management strategy, which provides for safety while meeting resource management objectives. Fire begins with ignition. The match is the most common ignition device. Friction creates sufficient heat to ignite the phosphorus. Combustion occurs, the match flames. The three most important ingredients required for combustion are heat, oxygen, and fuel. Heat, oxygen, and fuel complete the fire triangle and are necessary components to create fire. If any of these are missing, there can be no fire. In this demonstration, we have all of the ingredients necessary for combustion. Heat from the match, oxygen from the air, and fuel in the candle. But remove one of these ingredients, in this case, oxygen, and the fire goes out. The same principle is used in managing wildland fires. We control such fires by removing heat, by removing oxygen, by removing fuel. In wildland fires, heat sufficient to cause combustion is transferred to new sources of fuel in three different ways. By conduction, by convection, and by radiation. Conduction is the transfer of heat within the material itself. Most metals are good heat conductors. But wood, on the other hand, is a poor conductor and transmits heat slowly. Conduction is not an important factor in the spread of wildland fire. Convection is the transfer of heat by flow of liquids or gases. In the case of wildland fires, convection is well illustrated by the air and burned gases which rise above the fire. If the heated mixture is confined to a column, 
the convection current can be strong. Perhaps strong enough to reach 20,000 feet or higher into the atmosphere. Convection may cause dry snags to burn rapidly. Another method of transferring heat is by radiation. The Earth, for instance, is heated from the sun by radiation through space. In wildland fires, radiation will dry fuel ahead of the fire and increase its ability to ignite. How fire behaves when only one type of fuel is involved is simple in comparison with the complex nature of a wildland fire when a variety of fuels combine with weather and topography. With careful observation of fuel, weather, and topography, we can see the influence of each of these environmental elements and reasonably predict expected wildland fire behavior. The first element we must observe is fuel. Wildland fire behavior is affected by the amount of moisture in the fuel. Dry fuel burns faster than wet fuel. Size and shape of fuel is also a contributing factor. Light fuel is quickly heated and ignited as it is surrounded by plenty of oxygen. Fire in light fuel spreads rapidly but burns out quickly. Heavy fuel warms slowly and the interior becomes exposed to oxygen only after the outside has burned off. Fuel loading on an area is an obvious factor. The more fuel available, the more total heat output. Ordinarily, the greater the fuel loading readily available for burning, the more intense the fire will be. There is low fuel loading here. There is high fuel loading here. However, fuel loading may be arranged in different ways. Thus, continuity and arrangement may be more important than fuel loading itself. The fuel may be spread uniformly over the ground, or it may be patchy. There may be little fuel standing in the air above the ground, or there may be a lot of fuel above the ground in the form of snags, trees, and tall shrubs. All of these will affect the behavior of a wildland fire. Along with fuel, another important element affecting wildland fire behavior is weather. Temperature of the air influences fire. Temperature of the fuel determines how fast it will ignite and burn. There may be 50 degrees difference between fuel temperature in the sun and in the shade. Certainly one of the most important, least understood, and least predictable influences affecting wildland fire behavior is wind. Wind makes fire burn faster by increasing the supply of oxygen and by driving convection heat into new fuel. Wind can encourage combustion and the spread of fire in one direction, or it can cause rapid change in spread direction. Wind carries sparks and firebrands ahead of the main fire, starting spot fires. Wind increases evaporation from damp surfaces by carrying away moist air and replacing it with drier air. This directly affects fuel moisture. Fuel moisture influences wildland fire behavior because it affects the rate of combustion. When fuel is moist, combustion is slow because more heat is required to evaporate the moisture. As fuel becomes drier, more heat is available to heat the fuel itself. To demonstrate this point, the same type of fuel with different fuel moistures was burned in a special test chamber. The fuel in the upper chamber has a fuel moisture content of 7%. The fuel in the lower chamber has a fuel moisture content of 25%. All other conditions are equal. Note the higher combustion rate of the drier fuel in the upper chamber. Relative humidity is a factor of weather that indirectly affects wildland fire behavior. Dead fuel and the air are always exchanging moisture. Dry air, air characterized as having low relative humidity, takes moisture from the fuel. Fuel, in turn, takes moisture from the air when the relative humidity is high. Fuel moisture content changes in response to changes in the relative humidity of the surrounding air. 
The size of fuel will influence how quickly the fuel takes on or gives off moisture in response to a change in relative humidity. A light fuel, such as pine needles, readily shows the difference due to humidity. As fuel size increases, fuel moisture will respond slower to a change in relative humidity. All of these factors of weather, on their own or in combination, can change rapidly and will affect the behavior of a wildland fire. Topography is another environmental element to observe in order to understand wildland fire behavior. Aspect or direction in which a slope faces determines how much heating it gets from the sun. Different aspects receive sunlight at different times of day. Therefore, fuel temperature on a different aspect will change at different times throughout the day. Slope is another important influence of topography. The steeper a slope, the faster a fire burns. On a steep slope, the fuel uphill from the fire is preheated by radiation and convection and ignites easily. The position of the fire, whether near the bottom of a slope with unburned fuel above or near the top of a ridge with a change in fuel or slope ahead of the fire is another topographic factor. The basic shape of the country in the vicinity of a fire is an important influence when a wildland fire is burning in broken topography. For example, if a canyon is narrow, heat transfer by radiation can dry adjacent fuel on the opposite slope. This can allow fire to cross the canyon. Steep canyons can have the same effect on fire as the chimney on a stove. They create a forced convection. Another effect of topography is the influence of elevation. This is shown by the earlier drying out of vegetation and fuel at lower elevations in early spring. Looking back, we have seen that the fire triangle of heat, oxygen, and fuel is necessary for combustion to occur. Once a fire starts, it spreads by transferring heat energy through conduction, convection, and radiation. The behavior of a wildland fire after it is established depends on the following environmental elements. Fuel, weather, and topography, all acting together. When all three are favorable for the spread of fire, almost anything can happen. That is, anything can happen unless you, as a firefighter, intervene. One way to keep fire manageable is for you to determine fire management strategy based on your knowledge of how a wildland fire will behave in its changing environment. Is this a log or is it a fuel to sustain a fire? Is this slope merely a hard climb or is it a made to order path for fire? And is this a breathtaking view or a stoked and ready furnace waiting for ignition? Think in terms of fire behavior and firefighter safety when dealing with a wildland fire. Remember, it is the sum of many factors that makes a wildland fire burn as it does. Each area, of course, is unique, has its own concerns, its own ways of looking at issues. Most of the video that we showed you there, of course, was in mountainous areas. But, Will, we need to mention again, uh, you don't have a lot of mountains in Gainesville but you do have more than your share of fires sometimes. Well, that's true, and, and most of the southeastern United States and the East Coast is the same way, but we tend to have a lot more dense vegetation. There's more fuel per acre, uh, and much of that fuel has, is easily ignited and tends to burn with great intensity. So the problem remains the same, even though the environment may look a little different. The real problem is the fire that, that comes uh, up in these two areas that come together, the urban and the wildland. That's where, correct. Where they come together. That's correct. Yeah. And typically, it's us. It's people growing into the rural area. You bet. And Bill Mills, you always seem to be pre uh, preaching the uh, the the beauty of reducing risks of mitigating. What do you think is the most important thing for people to know? Mitigation is is the biggest bang for the buck. Mitigation is simply reducing your risk. We're never in a condition in this industry to prevent much. 
but we can make the risk smaller. And given that you would follow typical mitigation process, we can say you would have a 50-50 chance with everything that you own. And we think those are pretty good odds. So engage and share the responsibility of mitigating this hazard. And Dan, uh, there's a, a term that, uh, of, that is used that people may hear, firewise and firewise communities. Key to that is mitigating, as we say, being ready, being prepared. Very much so. I think mitigation, uh, I agree, is the most effective tool that we have in the toolbox today. And what we have to remember is the public has a responsibility uh, to uh, do things in living in the wildland urban interface. They made the decision to live there and they have some responsibilities that they need to understand to help mitigate this problem with wildland urban interface fires. And working with wildland and structural people, it's a partnership that really uh, can prove to be very effective if uh, all the players are sitting at the table and working on it. Yeah, Mike, we can't emphasize that enough, can we? That, that it is not a problem to hand off to our firefighters. It's not a problem to hand off to some government planner somewhere. It's a problem for all of us, homeowners, citizens, firefighters, whatever. It is a collective problem, and I think that the, there are tools, as Dan has stated, the homeowners need to take the responsibility as well as community, community leaders in the form of uh, building codes and zoning ordinances to assist the, the fire organizations to be better prepared to, uh, to mitigate these problems that we see along with the partnership and the compliance by the uh, homeowners to these different kind of rules and regulations to assist them in uh, keeping their homes safe. Well, is it getting any easier? Is awareness of this problem being raised enough that people respond as they should? Are you getting the public support that you need as a firefighter to be able to stay in the firehouse and not be out there putting out fires? It's slow to catch on. Uh, there are isolated areas in our, in our part of the state uh, that now are very aware of the firewise concepts, but for the most part, people think that when the fire threatens, that the fire department and the forestry service are going to be there to protect them, and in reality, there's so many houses and so many people in the interface that we don't have the resources to protect every house and every person. Dan, is there a single point you'd like to make before we close out this segment? Oh, well, I think, again, uh, I, I agree. I think that, that we have watched America change over the last two decades with increased numbers of homes lost and, and more and more fires and more people living in the interface areas, and it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just the fire service. Great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, this, this section of our program today has been an introduction. It's not the final answer. It's not designed to do anything more than just get you aware and get you involved, because your involvement, your awareness, is in fact clearly our best defense against this growing problem across America. We've not tried to offer you all the answers, just raise some of the questions and hope that you'll continue to raise the questions in your communities, because these are the questions that you and your community should be asking yourselves. So you look out the window and you realize your house is not just in suburbia, but it's in a place that we call a wildland urban interface. We're going to continue our discussions with our panel of experts here and with Bill Mills out in Colorado Springs. I want to start with Bill. Bill, many people think the answer to keeping their house safe in, a, in one of these wildland urban interface areas is just clearing the land. Are many of these homeowners surprised to learn they face wildland urban fire concerns in what they thought was just suburbia? The whole perception of the mitigation piece now is that you go rent a bulldozer and you cut a 30-foot circle completely around any structures that might be out there. And that is certainly not what we're about in my community. We are not about clear cutting. We're about managing uh, horizontal and vertical separations of natural fuels and as opposed to removal, more reduction of fuels. It's uh, for your old fire science types. It's a reduction in the BTUs and natural fuels and that ignitability piece up against the, the man-made fuel, which is the structure. So they need to look at horizontal and vertical um, separations of fuel as it relates to their house. They need to look at the dangerous adjacent topography. 
as it relates to their house. What does that mean? That means are you situated on a ridge line, in a saddle, a chimney, a canyon that's going to influence wildfire behavior? Is there dangerous adjacent vegetation? What is your roof type? What are the siding types? Double pane versus single pane windows? Uh, were non-combustible features addressed in the landscaping of the property, like patio decks and walkways and, and those natural fuels that would be directly adjacent to window openings in the house and so on. So we are asking the, the community at large, uh, it's, as we visit with them, we still hear old Cold War solutions to everything, and it's time for the community at large to engage in this possibility of knowing as much about wildfire mitigation as I know about it. Because as we've said in the past, it ain't rocket science, folks, but there is a fair amount of physics involved. So we'd like to have them look at their properties and be the fire. Understand fire and its behavior and, and, and see if they are at risk. Now we'll talk about responding to a fire in just a few minutes, but uh, the biggest advice for homeowners is clearly that they need to act before a fire happens to minimize the chances that their house will burn. Again, this is not a West Coast problem. It's not an East Coast problem. It's a national problem, and it can occur in almost any part of these United States. So, Bill, what's the most common mistake that you've seen people make before a fire threatens them? What mistakes have you seen them make hands-on? I worry about citizens who may s woefully overestimate their capabilities. Um, I'm g just going to take a stab at those physics. Uh, a heat pulse of 1,200 degrees for 120 seconds. Um, John Wayne with a garden hose isn't going to save the kids on that one. So. Use your community to help you define what the level of acceptable risk is um, and create a reality picture for them on stand and fight issues. Uh, before a fire, a common mistake is I've got insurance, uh, it'll take care of it. And I think people need to uh, get with their carrier and see what a reality piece is on, on replacement of that insurance or, or replacement of their property at 100% and really what that insurance will cover. Um, another misperception is it just isn't going to happen here and reality is that our lifespans are a little out of sync with Mother Nature's uh, fire interval, if you will. So it's not a matter of if uh, fires are going to happen in your wildland urban interface it's a matter of when so it can happen here and at some time it it probably will happen here is the rule that you have to follow it can happen in many places so what can you do to help reduce your risk well let's take a look at a video that was produced out in kitsie county washington In other news, wildfires destroyed another 17 homes in what local officials described as the worst. Well, we never worried about wildfire. The last one was back in 1933. Some caused by lightning, but some deliberately set. Authorities listed 27 homes as immediately endangered, dozens more at risk. Greater population density in rural areas is the natural result of urban growth. The increased cost of living, traffic jams, and other frustrations are leading people to seek property in remote and often forested areas. As metropolitan areas expand, we can expect to confront many challenges in this overlapping area of civilization and wilderness, which we call the wildland-urban interface. One major concern, fire. On one hand, fire is a natural and important part of the ecosystem. On the other hand, in a human environment, fire can be destructive, even deadly. Poor signage and road conditions, secluded homesteads and overgrowth hinder the ability of firefighters to arrive in time to protect lives and property. 
Hello, I'm Roger Ferris, and today we're talking about how to enjoy this lush, forested area in ways that enhance the safety and beauty of our homes. Homeowners are learning that it's possible to maintain an attractive, natural landscape while reducing the risk of starting a wildfire and reducing the risk of destruction caused by an advancing wildfire. We've made our project a weekend event with partnerships between government, local organizations, and the homeowners to be able to show you a difference at this one residence. Joining us are a group of experts who will provide tips to help us create wildfire-resistant landscapes and gardens that look great. Does that sound confusing or expensive? It doesn't have to be. Most of what you're going to see today, you'll be able to do yourself. The technical resources are usually free, and the work can be done alone, or possibly by trading labor with a neighbor who may also be at risk. Let's get started. Hi, Peg. Hey, Roger. Fire safety can be a real challenge, especially when trees such as this are too close to the home. Nature has a way of moving in, but there are ways to control it. Your garden and yard is a wonderful place to spend time. Enjoy your yard by maintaining it a little at a time. Examine your garden. You may already have the right plants on your property that just need to be moved or trained. Derek, this is a beautiful setting. What's the problem here? Well, you see beauty, I see fuel. Fire requires three things, fuel, oxygen, and heat. Reduce any of these and you reduce the possibility of fire. In a forest like this, since we can't do much about oxygen or heat, we've learned to focus on fuel. When you allow nature to grow right up to the front door, it's as if you're extending a bridge of fuel for the fire, directly from the forest to your home. Stop the fire by removing the bridge. For example, this tree. What I recommend is to remove the tree, or at the very least, trim the branches away from the house. Now, ivy is a fire retardant plant, but unfortunately, it's also extremely invasive. You're right, Derek. Unfortunately, we don't have to sacrifice beauty to prevent fire. We can learn to manage nature's growth and add value to our property by correctly maintaining the landscape. Did you know there are specific plants that are actually resistant to fire? And some have the added benefit of resisting drought, a good quality in any location with long, hot summers. Maintaining a garden with hardy plants like these can mitigate hazards associated with wildfire. Good gardening practices are commonly overlooked as one way to reduce the risks associated with fires. In fact, there are many creative options available that actually reduce the potential for wildfire. Derek, Peg used the word mitigate. What does that mean for the person on the street? Well, mitigation just means the ongoing activities we take before an emergency that will reduce or even eliminate damage. Those sound like sensible precautions. Hey, glad you could make it, Jim. Why don't you walk us through the project so far? OK. You know, keeping a yard up is a constant process, and there's no one-time fix for everything. In this situation, we decided to prune some trees that were too close to the house. Here's what it looked like when we started. With the help of Puget Sound Energy and Ask One Tree Expert Company, uh, we removed these overhanging maple trees from the west side of the home. Removing trees of this size requires quite a bit of expertise. And for safety's sake, it's a good idea to do this when we're not going to have a lot of people moving around below. Once you remove trees of this size, you will also have to grind the stump. Clearing about a 30-foot perimeter here creates a couple of definite benefits. As Derek mentioned, it removes bridges that direct fire from the forest to the home. More sunlight, the yard gives us options for new plants and flowers. Before we go further, let's mention a couple of things you should consider before undertaking a project of this sort in your home. First, defensible space is a term you'll hear throughout this video. It is the area between your home and the surrounding wilderness that acts as a safety buffer during a fire. It changes depending on the terrain and ranges between 30 to 100 feet from your home in all directions. Second, permits are not negotiable. If they're required in your area, you need to get them. 
so do your homework. Another consideration is use of native plants. They are more resistant to disease and many pose a lower fire risk. These are examples of Northwest native plants and they're quite beautiful. This is a commonly overlooked part of planning a new defensible space garden. Having the right plants can mean the difference between a healthy yard and a jungle. Now, back to our tour of the project. Jim, let's see how things are going in clearing. As you can see, Roger, quite a few trees were removed for today's mitigation makeover. We wanted to maintain the natural feel of this property with animal habitat preserved as best as possible. Here, we're actually creating critter environments with some of the branches. And rather than burn what's left over, which causes pollution, is often unsafe and often illegal, we're going to mulch our yard waste to recycle for ground cover. So now I know what to plant around my home. But as a homeowner, how thrilled am I that you want me to cut down a bunch of my trees? Trees are one of the reasons I moved out here in the first place. No, that's not what we're saying. These trees are native and drought resistant and fire resistant. They just need a little attention. You have to keep branches like these from hanging over the roof or close to the eaves. And trimming them back will help reduce that chance. This was a Gary Oak, one of only a couple natural oak species to be found in the Northwest. So it would have been a terrible shame to cut it down. Here's how we cleaned it up. Cut away the overhang and made it a much safer tree. What about timing? Is there a best season to do wildfire maintenance? Good question. We recommend early spring or later in the fall because the hot spark from a chainsaw in July could ignite the fire we're trying to avoid. He's right. Once the fire gets started, it could spread in a variety of ways. It can move across treetops, burning extremely hot, but moving quickly enough that it doesn't sustain too much heat. It can also travel through the air as far as half mile in advance of a big crown fire. Those little floating embers can easily find their way into small crevices between wood shingles or around the home and smolder, eventually starting a fire. Near the ground, fire can move from tree branch to brush to wood stack or debris, which is what we've addressed here. Looking around this house, we are trying to locate areas that are particularly prone to fire. Leaves and debris can act as dry tinder for airborne embers. This brush growing right up to the garage is a textbook example of extending a fire bridge directly from the forest to your home. Another common fire bridge is debris piled next to a structure. Combustible items like this are an open invitation to spreading fire and embers. Look for unprotected areas on the eaves, decks, and porches or small openings that might hide smoldering material. What about a deck or a wooden shingled roof? Those are the areas that we need to be concerned about. We also want to close off any openings under eaves or other small openings around the structure. Now, I noticed in the plan that there's going to be a deck or patio located in the backyard. Is that going to be trouble? Not at all. Because of the wildfire potential, we specifically wanted to put a brick patio here. It's practical and it looks great for the homeowner. And best of all, it forms a non-flammable barrier between the home and forest. Well, that's fine here, but what if I already have a wooden deck? Good question. Pressure-treated lumber requires a lot higher temperature and sustained exposure to fire to really ignite. So we don't worry much about them. On the other hand, wood shake roofing is another story. Since roofing specifications vary with geographic regions, we strongly recommend consulting with local building departments for appropriate fire-resistant ratings. Remember, the larger the surface area, the greater the chance an ember will land on it. And in wildfires, embers can be as big as a dinner plate. Airborne embers are responsible for a huge percentage of homes burning, even if the actual forest fire doesn't come close enough to ignite the house. Fortify your home so embers can't find a way into hidden pockets. Excellent point. Come on, let's go check out the progress on the patio. As you can see, this area of the home hasn't been used much because it was nearly overgrown by the forest. This patio will help put a buffer zone between the trees and home to prevent future vegetative growth, and it will also make a great new area to have a barbecue or just relax.
good. Hey, you're just in time. We've leveled this area to grade, and we're in the process of laying the pavers. Local mitigation projects like this one are really great. It's so important that each home and family is protected against wildfires, floods, and earthquakes. Every precaution taken now will increase the chances of saving homes when disaster strikes. And if it means I have to get my hands dirty, oh well. And having all these volunteers pitch in to help really raises awareness of land stewardship and mitigation. When we have a chance to help someone out while educating the public, all the better. What do you think, Melody? It looks great. And although it does take some work, some money and some time, the cost is nothing compared to what we would lose if we actually had a wildfire. By following the process that we've outlined here, learning about permits, vocabulary, plants, and the nature of fire, it's possible to increase safety for all of us. Fires are a fact of life in wildland urban interface areas but we can and must take steps to keep the hazards to a minimum. If you're currently building your home, plan your landscape so it won't encroach onto your property too far. And if you're working with a landscape architect, consider carefully what vegetation you use and where you locate it. And remember, just because a forested area hasn't burned recently does not mean it won't burn. It has years of unchecked growth for fuel. So how your garden grows may well determine how your house survives. And we were looking at a tape there, of course, from the Pacific Northwest. The, the rules are different, the environments are different, but the common sense is the same, whether it's in the Pacific Northwest or the, or the Northwest or the Southwest or anywhere across the United States. And, and it was interesting sitting here with, these, uh, with our, our panelists watching us because they, of course, spotted things that they said, well, wait a minute, they should do this and they should do that and so on and so forth. Uh, Will, you were talking about some of the things that you spotted there that would be different in your community because of different regulations, different rules, and so on. But it's all about the same thing, is it not? Which is just pre keeping the fire away from your house if a fire happens. That's correct, and it depends on uh, the flammability or combustibility of the, of the natural vegetation and trees that surround the house or surround the community. Uh, you want to minimize as much of the high combustible or high flammable materials as you can. But the other thing is not, you don't have to create a moonscape around a structure to protect it, but you do have to remove some fuel and you have to break that fuel up, both horizontally and vertically. So it's a matter of taking a number of trees and plants out to create that hor hor uh, horizontal uh, space in there, and then to trim limbs and that sort of thing to, to keep it from traveling from the surface fuels up to into the treetops. So the, the, same, the same principles apply wherever you go in the country. You just have to read the terrain and read the, the natural vegetation and even landscape vegetation uh, for your community and, and, and work from that standpoint. Mike, what do you say to the homeowner though who says, wait, I, I bought this property because it is kind of in the woods. It is out away from everybody else in the city. It's, it's not like an urban lot per se. I love having those beautiful trees and the brush up next to the house and so on. What, how do you convince them? That's a difficult, it's a, that's a difficult question, but particularly it depends on the mindset of the individual that bought that house. But I think that's where the, uh, the community leaders and other community members come into play because if we have ordinances and we have zoning laws, to, then you can force that individual to do what needs to be done. It's going to take an aggressive approach by the fire service and the communities and community leaders to get everybody working on the same page because you're going to be able to get most people understanding that and taking the, taking the, uh, the appropriate approach because it's a common sense thing to do. But you're going to have the person that sits out there by themselves that doesn't want to do that. And the only way that's going to happen is based on proper supportive laws and regulations. Dan, one of the common sense things is that fire doesn't respect property lines. So uh, if you have someone in an area that is sloppy about how they prepare for or pr try to prevent these fires, you put a whole, a whole town at risk. Well, that's true. And, and I think there's some success stories out there in the United States that have that scenario uh, that you just talked about occurred. In, in, in real life situations where 
you have a community that works really hard to fire proof fire safe you know their their homes and then you have people adjacent that don't do anything fire comes in there and there's been some really good success stories of fire coming into communities like that laying down so the fire departments can get in and deal with it and the people that have not dealt with that have lost homes and it's very evident and uh, that word travels fast in you mm -hmm. know in in, uh, in communities and people seem to be getting the message although it's slow uh, but the message is starting to get out that it does make a difference and it's personal responsibility you know take care of your property and and we find that uh, as people do that uh, the ones that are a little bit reluctant to uh, ultimately, you know, come around and and, uh, and do something as well. Well, we've been talking about prevention a lot. Let's talk about the the literal life and death issue of what happens when the fire is approaching your house and what should you do. Bill, out in Colorado Springs, you and other departments often echo what the Department of Homeland Security has now advised all Americans that we should have a 72-hour emergency kit ready at all times. The first step in that evac in the uh, preparation piece for an emergency is understanding that these are these are common features across wildfire, tornado, hurricane, flood, disaster du jour. Uh, the 72-hour kit. What's valuable to you? We have questions from neighborhoods about. Uh, lists and precisely what should be in a 72-hour kit. Uh, please just sit down and think about what's valuable to you. If you have jewelry that's more valuable than your medications, then put the jewelry in a box. The point being is you are the one that makes those decisions, and you must engage in what goes in the kit and in the preparation for evacuation. Post 9-11, Evacuation is no longer a static event. I won't put up evacuation signs for a wildfire because I'd have to print on them if this sign is on fire, don't go here. Uh, bad guys are going to cause bad things to happen that can't be predicted as a static event. Snow routes don't work anymore. The homeowners can't look for us as agencies to cause this to happen for them. They have to be a part of the equation and sharing this responsibility to understand several ways out of their area. Well, if there isn't a way out of your area, then you mitigate your hazard to the degree that you can shelter in place. There aren't enough engines in the Western United States to cover wildfires. Do the math. It's that easy. Homeowners and communities are going to have to engage in the possibility of helping themselves. I'm not calling for, for a, a volunteer militia of firefighters. I'm calling for a volunteer militia of mitigators. Deal with this before the ignition. So, Will, when there is an ignition, when there is a fire, we've all seen these spectacular pictures of homeowners out on the roof with a garden hose. What do you tell people about that? We recommend that they not do that. If it's that close, they feel like they have to put water on their roof or water on their, on their house. They should be getting their 72-hour their kit, and they should be evacuating. And, Bill, out in uh, Colorado, in your community, what have you told residents they can do to help the firefighters once a fire begins? Think about the fire environment. Right now you're standing in front of your home saying, uh, gee, if I, uh, I just took a hose out and I could defend this and I could fight off some little sparks and brands and so on. But think about the environment that is probably the worst fog day in San Francisco's history. In other words, we can't even, we can't even find your house to help you let alone an address, it, it, you're going to be covered up. So notions like porch lights could come on so we could find you. We're about saving the lives first and then the property. And uh, so the citizens can understand that strategic piece too, is that if you're dead, what's the point of having the house to live in? Um, so the, as far as a strategic or a tactical priority for them, is that mitigate your hazard and 
if you're not going to evacuate the area and you choose to shelter in place, um, the whole notions of standing on roofs with garden hose and trying to put out embers, the net result is you're putting firefighters at risk because you're putting yourself in harm's way and you're causing them to attempt to make a rescue when they could, in effect, be focusing on the fire and its extinguishment. So as we wrap up, let's hear some final thoughts from our experts here on the panel. Mike, what would you want the homeowners to not forget? Not forget that uh, the preparation of their home for the firefighters to come and protect it is probably the most important thing they can do in the mitigation, matter, mitigation perspective. Keep their kits available know what their evacu evacuation routes are, know how to get out and know where they're going to go when they leave mm -hmm. and know how they're going to let their next of kin and important people know that they're okay. Will? Well, that their safety is very important and mm -hmm. it's the most important thing of all. Their home can be replaced, the contents can be replaced. Uh, they should have their, their own plan, they should develop their plan and they should rehearse it fairly frequently and that would be when to get out, how to get out and what to take with them and do it immediately. Dan? I think uh, just to sum up, it's personal responsibility. Uh, following up with uh, everybody's uh, comments here, uh, homeowners have to take personal responsibility to deal with the issue. We're all in this one together, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yes. Well, thanks all of you, and, and thank you for being with us for this presentation. Now we've seen what these fires are, what you can do to help prevent them, and what you have to do if they do happen, if prevention has failed. We need your help, and we hope this has been useful in your planning. It's a beginning to an end that we think we all can support, trying to live safe and happy lives here in the United States of America. We thank you for your support. More information is available from your local fire departments. We urge you to stay in contact with them. They need your help, and someday you may need theirs. Thanks again to all of our panelists, and thanks to you.